Good morning, everybody, and welcome to my first virtual job. Uh, yeah, so thank you for taking time out to, to come and visit us today on uh, what looks like a lovely Tuesday morning. Uh, a couple of bits of housekeeping just to begin with. So firstly, just to let you know that the session will be recorded and shared afterwards. So, yep, anything that, that doesn't get picked up, you'll be able to sort of view in your own time. Uh, and also, if anyone has any questions at any point throughout the the webinar, please ask them in the chat function. We'll be adding these all in alongside our graduate panel at the end. So yeah, just to kick off, let's take you on to the agenda for the day. So firstly, a quick introduction for me. I'm Chris May, the sales manager on Milk Round. Been with the company for just over two years now, but have been in graduate recruitment for the best part of 12 years. So I've seen some significant change over this time and have done that. I'll be taking the, the, the first stage of this presentation and talk you through our, our recent research around the, the situation for students and graduates at the moment, their experiences of recruitment and onboarding, but also we'll touch on what, what potentially looks like the future of work as we go ahead as well. Uh, following that, I'll be handing over to Steve Ward, who's here. He's a country manager from Universum, who are, if you don't know, they're a global employer branding insights company absolute experts in their field and he's going to be sharing with us kind of lots of their insight around employer branding advice for this new workforce and how we can adapt accordingly and then to finish off ever popular as we've done before we'll be handing over to our student and graduate panel so Charlotte will be leading this from the Milk Grand marketing team and we're really happy to be joined today by Daniel, Katie, Antonia and Sophia to help answer your questions but also add some kind of candidate insight into that so Say hello, everybody. Cool, brilliant. So that's all the really good stuff to come from there. Uh, but we'll let them all kind of go and take themselves away briefly. And you'll be stuck with me for the, the first bit from here. So yeah, we just wanted to set the scene initially no big surprise to what's occurred within the past 12 months but looking at the isc we're looking at the, the impact of covid has given us kind of the biggest decrease in graduate recruitment since the 2008 recession so we've all had different challenges you can see on the right hand side here kind of various different stories and, and trust me it, it wasn't difficult for us to find lots and lots of these that were relevant from there uh, some of the stuff that we do know very early that the volume applications went up by 14% last year across the board. However, there was a decrease in, in opportunities for students by 12%. So that's more applications across less vacancies, which I'm sure has created lots and lots of different challenges that were probably as unexpected as anything else for us. Uh, a couple of early signs from here though, uh, charity and public sector uh, were the only industries that saw an increase in hiring and, and unsurprisingly knowing the makeup of the ISC, but IT engineering and finance made up the largest percentage of roles that employers were hiring for within the past 12 months. Uh, so we want to start off with a quick poll. There'll be, there'll be about three or four of these throughout this, this talk. So we just like to know from you at the moment, uh, how many graduates have you hired in the past year? So hopefully all of the tech's gonna be working and you'll see a question come up shortly to vote. So here's a question, we'll give it a, a few seconds for everyone to contribute on here. And hopefully we'll shortly see the responses. So, so as you can see here, there's 14% there's of, of people in the room today that didn't hire due to the pandemic and over a third here that, that less than usual. Interestingly though, and, and definite would be interesting to see any sort of things that get raised off the back of this, but 21% say more than usual. So it's a very interesting kind of insight there potentially into strategies or reactions to, to what's occurred with us from, from here. Uh, so the next bit we're gonna look at is, let's present what we did. So we went out and surveyed over 3,000 students and graduates, as well as 500 HR decision makers. So we felt it was really key, not just to get 
the understanding from from students and graduates but also from from people in the industry as well and i know from our, our previous research there were some areas that aligned extremely well some that really actually demonstrated some quite severe disparities from from that so yep let's take a look at the next step uh, so the demographics from here showed us Yeah, sorry, I've lost my way slightly. Uh, yeah, showed us from here the way it kind of looks in terms of the breakdown of people that we surveyed. So in terms of these graduates, what we've seen is quite a consistency here that, that September and January were the spikes in terms of recruitment. So very similar to what we've possibly seen before, but not any kind of significant difference from that moving forwards on it. So, so lower numbers, but a very similar pattern. Also, we thought we'd share this just so it, it does sort of demonstrate, we, we surveyed kind of an equal number of candidates, but anything that we take from here, there, there was quite a, a high number of kind of female respondents to our survey. But if anyone would like to see any of the numbers that we present today based on a, a gender breakdown, by all means, let us know that we can supply from there. So we've labeled the next stage as the current situation. And I guess what we wanted to understand is, is what impact initially has that had. So if we look at the next slide from there, we'll, we'll find quite interestingly that a certain number of people, so, so one in 10 students have said that they plan to stay in education for longer than they previously planned, with two thirds of these looking to do a master's degree. So definitely if we look at the, the kind of quote on the right hand side, we know that, that students are aware that there's increased competition and has this encouraged the change in strategy from, from there? Uh, I guess the only caveat to understand and something to kind of take on mind here is the possible long-term impact this could have on diversity and social mobility. So this one in 10 students, are they the more affluent that are able to take this path and don't have as much of that demand on them having to, to start earning an income and, and starting their careers rather than being able to kind of put that on the back burner and increase their, their kind of upskilling from there. So I guess we just need to be conscious in the next couple of years that what we don't do is look more favourably on candidates that potentially had more opportunity to go and increase their, their academic background. Uh, we also wanted to get an idea of location of candidates. So if we look at the following, we know that a third of candidates move role. So a third of the candidates that started their first role remotely during 2020 did move to a different area to work. Not unsurprisingly, some of the reasons for here were the ability to save money. So, so less demand on the need to be in a city centre location to start a role remotely. Uh, potentially being closer to family and friends. So we know that that migration that happens when you do graduate, whether you stay in the city where you were, were studying or whether you do look to return home or, or a completely new base entirely. And, and obviously, yeah, again, concerns around the cost of living in a larger city. Uh, I guess what this does give us though is a, is a mindfulness we need to have towards work from home spaces. So are we conscious that, that some of these candidates may have re returned to a family home where they could be with, with siblings and, and other people having to work or school in the same environment that they're in? Uh, alternatively, we've heard stories of student house shares where 50% have started work remotely and 50% have, have been either on furlough or unemployed and the kind of changes in dynamic that makes in, in the work home balance and, and life from there. Uh, so if we look at it next, we look at an even bigger breakdown in terms of if they have moved home, well, where, where have they moved? So, so looking at this, quite interestingly, we can see decreases in London, Yorkshire, Southwest and the North East, but increases in every single other location that we have. So, so clearly it has been an element of migration of people from the really obvious places that people would, would normally kind of look to locate themselves for work. Uh, but I guess the question this, this does create is, whilst there was a short-term flexibility, which gave people the ability to apply for different jobs regardless of their kind of current location, uh, we held a focus group last week and one of the, the concerns is that this will potentially lead to kind of the dreaded reneges that, that have kind of haunted graduate recruiters for the last kind of four to five years as candidates suddenly realise that they can't relocate on a return to an office or they don't have that flexibility moving forward to, to be located wherever they might choose to be and to go from there. So just to be conscious when normality returns that is this a short-lived change in, in kind of migration and location 
or is there the ability potentially for it to remain from there? Uh, the next we wanted to look at, and it's not a huge surprise, but, but let's consider the, the candidate confidence. It's, it's been scary enough for a lot of us in employment to kind of understand what's going to happen, what's around the corner. Imagine if you're, you're starting out for the first time. So, so unsurprisingly, over half of our students and graduates surveyed believe that the pandemic is actually going to negatively impact their, their future career. And 62% also feel it's going to impact their their own kind of development opportunities, even if they do get an employment. Uh, this can't cost a lot. So, so each year we run our candidate compass. And in 2020, 62% of candidates told us that they still believed that they were going to be able to go and work in their dream industry. This was quite a significant drop from 83% of candidates in 2019 that believed the same. Uh, the other, if we have a look at kind of the, the career development prospects, and how that works is the Institute of Fiscal Studies reported that in 2008, graduates are earning 6% less after one year and 2% lower after five years compared to other cohorts and intakes from there. So, so clearly there is a, a drag, there is a kind of impact of this that can carry these candidates into their careers much longer. Uh, we also know from the Institute of Student Employers that salaries have remained stagnant this year, which we know and it's well documented that against inflation, it's a relative drop. If, if salaries aren't going up and inflation is, so it's, it's something that's going to affect candidates far beyond just from here. So what this might mean if, if confidence is being affected, does it need a change of direction, a change of that strategy from there? So we can see here that 45% that of people we surveyed aren't currently working in the industry that they hope to work in. And 38% have said that the pandemic has actually made them consider working in a different industry. Uh, so there is these kind of concerns. And if we, we have a look here, it, it's quite evident that the industries that people really are keen to working, like arts and culture and sales, media and marketing industries, are ones quite heavily affected by what we do. Uh, it's also worth pointing out, and we had discussed this, there's, there's a significant spike in the industry that people are working in. Which, which probably looks like an anomaly for retail catering and leisure. I think a conclusion we kind of arrived at with that is it's potentially candidates that haven't actually started that, that graduate career and are still retained in the kind of roles that they're, they're most likely to have worked in whilst they were at university and, and do that. Uh, something that is interesting though, that one in 10 have stated that the pandemic has inspired them to work in an industry that employs key workers. So there's no shortage of kind of positive PR to the NHS and the job that teachers have done over the past kind of 12 months. We also know from our December research beyond the buzzword that the industries with, with more key workers tend to have a much more positive reputation towards their, their attitudes to diversity. So there's some real benefits in there that we can take, giving the positive kind of reputation of some of these industries. I think this also really, really demonstrates kind of the the additional resilience and adaptability that we see in students and, and, a, and a key awareness of kind of how, how that works from there. There's also something without stealing Steve's thunder from what he's going to talk about in a bit, but the, the concentration on sectors that potentially have a bit more stability moving forward or traditionally are known for having more stability and whether that's a much bigger driver now for candidates as they, they enter kind of the, the world of work for the first time post-graduation and doing that. Uh, so that's the, the kind of current situation, but let's take you on to the next step, which is more about kind of people's experiences of the past 12 months around kind of their, their recruitment and onboarding. So if we look at the, the first line, again, hugely unsurprising, but 54% of graduates were recruited fully via virtual methods. So they didn't meet a single member of their team prior to accepting a role and to do that. Uh, and also 17% of companies use virtual interviews. This increased to, so previously prior to COVID-19, that's now increased to, to over a third. We also know that attraction has, has also moved much more online. We know for ourselves, for our kind of uh, candidate acquisition for, for our websites that we had to move away from some of our campus activity and become a lot more kind of online and a lot kind of more innovative about the ways that we did it. 
And we know from the, the 500 HR professionals that, that we surveyed that 82% kind of went back to the tried and tested recruitment platforms, uh, such as Milkground ourselves, uh, with 80% using their own website and 79% utilizing social media. I think it would be shameless, but also remiss of me not to mention that, that over the past 12 months, we, we did actually a, registered in excess of 233,000 students and graduates from a diverse range of over 100 universities. So quite interesting from there. Uh, the next, we'd just like to take you to the next poll. And, okay. No, so that's unfolding at home, sorry. The next poll comes afterwards. So, yep, that's here. So we know that in terms of onboarding at home, 37% of our candidates were not sent technology so no company laptop potentially no no kind of setup no no dongles to assist them with internet or wi-fi which you know is quite important from there and 67 percent were not sent any home office equipment such as a desk or a chair however almost one in five did receive money to help purchase these items and to do that i guess what's really important from here is that we do understand that the home setup is extremely important. There's been lots of increase in, in kind of the mental well-being of what people were doing before, but also the physical well-being as well. How has that been affected as, as it's gone along? So will we be suffering from, from back pain in the future? Will there be lots of issues around that as we kind of go along from there? So I think it's something that we definitely need to understand as we move along. Uh, and then moving forward from there, is it more important as well how candidates work from a social and, and well-being perspective? So 53% of candidates have said that they've struggled to make friends in their workplace. 54% uh, revealing that they, they believe that remote working negatively impacted their mental health. Uh, loneliness was the number one reason that was cited here. So are we, are we conscious of candidates potentially that are living alone and doing and working how they do on that side. Uh, something else really interesting from, from this is that one in five of the candidates we surveyed did actually suggest that they may never meet their colleagues in real life before leaving their current role, which, which is probably a situation we couldn't have imagined just over 12 months ago now. Uh, however, interestingly, and, and a definite change and a definite kind of distinction between the new workforce and, and kind of established, is we know from our focus group last week that there, there seems to be a definite, a much greater hunger around these, this kind of new cohort to get back into the workplace and start kind of physically socialising with, with their co-members and, and going from there, which is definitely really interesting and, and, and great to see on that. Uh, going ahead from this, we wanted to understand whether diversity was impacted by this. And, and I guess initial feedback appears really, really positive from here. So 74% of candidates feeling that being able to work remotely has, has given more opportunity to people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. This is also the same percentage given to us by HR decision makers as well on that side. Uh, we also know not just the pandemic, but Black Lives Matter and some of the recent kind of issues regarding kind of safety of women and, and these opportunities that seven out of ten HR decision makers have said that recent events have made them kind of reconsider how they can make their recruitment much more inclusive. So I think the events of the past year are fueling change. However, again, from some of our conversations we've had recently with employers, we just need to be careful that we don't get too carried away here. So one of the key things that was pointed out to us that what there has been in the past year is a real surge in male applications. So we've known for years that that male candidates are more, more inclined to apply sooner than female candidates, which can disproportionately kind of appear in the way that the applications are received. Perhaps a, a behavioural change in this as well is, is a greater search to apply for more roles. And if, if that starts having an impact on these applications, what do we do to kind of balance that out on that? So that's, that's one area definitely that's worth considering. So we do need to take in that there's, there's some real short term positives in terms of it but how does this look for kind of future challenges as we move forward? Uh, the next thing we wanted to ask about was around training and, and how that's received, been received by candidates and how it's potentially very different to what we've had. 
So we know, we've all learned ourselves that the past 12 months has, has given us a completely different set of skill sets that we've needed to develop, a different set of etiquettes that we need to behave towards now that we work a lot more virtually. And it's really refreshing to see that, that a large portion of people are receiving this. So the percentage that received training and found it useful, found it really worked well around their communication skills, skills and collaboration in kind of this, this kind of virtual world and what we had. However, more concerning is a third of these graduates uh, feel that they didn't receive any formal onboarding to the company. So I've got no doubts that this did exist. However, how is it portrayed? How is it managed and how does it kind of carry on from there? We also know that, that some of the areas that for a lot of us, we know our roles from the office space that, that moved remotely. For these candidates, they don't have necessarily as much of an awareness of, of what is expected of them and how that's managed in a slightly different kind of workplace and, and environment from there. So there definitely needs to be a bit more focus, as we've mentioned before, around sort of the well-being and productivity. And that's being asked for here as well. So 42% so would like to receive more virtual training around their own wellness techniques, how they can kind of cope in these environments, how they can understand how to reach out for help and understand more from there. And the next piece around productivity as well. So not having people around you can make you kind of question yourself quite a lot and understanding that and are you performing as, as well as you can potentially in, in the role that you're carrying out so we found that really interesting the other thing that we understand and, and have experienced ourselves is is onboarding is no longer just an induction and then straight into the world of work it definitely is something that needs to be supported for a hell of a lot longer than ever has before uh, which takes us to our next question that we'd like to ask you all and so the following poll is, has productivity levels dropped in graduate workers since working remotely? So hopefully that will pop up. Yep, and we'll give you a few seconds just to see from your view whether there has been an impact. Cool, we should get this shortly. Okay, so quite reassuringly, so some people aren't, aren't too sure, but 40% have said that they, they've seen a drop, uh, a greater number seen an increase, and actually only, only kind of 13% saying that they have seen any, any drops. So that's definitely kind of, uh, hopefully a ringing endorsement for remote working and, and the benefits it can have. And as we, we've kind of said a couple of times, we all went into last year having to adapt now that we can kind of prepare better for the future. This is definitely a really positive sign and to do it. So, so moving forward, I guess, how can we support talent more remotely? So firstly, onboarding and training are key. If a third of candidates believe they receive no, no kind of formal induction or training, that's definitely a concern. So a great start is the best start for people and also needs to be adapted and needs to be relevant to the changing situation. Uh, the next is make sure that all of your candidates have an adequate working from home setup. So we kind of call it the remote bricks and mortar. Lots of effort has gone into office spaces and layouts and kitchens and desks. How does that work at home and how can people be supported as best from there? Uh, as ever, you would have a, a huge support structure if you were based in an office. So how is that moved virtually and, and how can it be kind of something that, that carries people throughout their duration of working? So, so make sure that keeps going, whether that's kind of through having peer buddies or regular social events, is it making people feel kind of attached to the business and believing in the culture and going from there. Uh, be honest about forthcoming career prospects. If there's particular goals and timelines that need to be met, let people know about that. Really kind of encourage that the, the old phrase that kind of tough times kind of don't last forever and there will be outcomes and more bits from that. Which takes us to the next. So to let people know what career development is available to them. Let's let's create this optimism. Let's Let's look beyond here and know that there is going to be great opportunity for these candidates and how we can kind of avoid some of this, this lag that existed in 2008 and the previous recession and how we can kind of move from that. Uh, and also hold yourselves accountable to making changes to not just social mobility, but diversity and everything else. I know the number one thing that we have learned from the last year is the need to, to really make action and, and nothing's going to change unless we change it ourselves. 
and to do it. So that's kind of a summary around uh, recruitment and onboarding. Uh, and then just to close off, we've just got a couple of bits now around the future of work. So the big question that everyone's being asked, and I think I saw something recently that if you do ask a hundred people their view on this, you probably get a hundred different views. So it's quite interesting here that, that nearly half of the graduates would like to have the option to work remotely and also in offices kind of flexibly as they choose moving forwards. Uh, I think the most popular was kind of one in five saying that one to two days in the office would work for them the best, but being kind of majority remote. Uh, looking at the other way, 13% not wanting any office time. So, so relatively kind of low in terms of that, but also relatively low the number of people that would want to commit 100% to that. So definitely something for us to take as we move forward. Extremely subjective here is the comment. And in their case, working remotely is an improvement, but it's nice to meet for live discussions. And I think it's not just going to change kind of the format of how we work, but how the offices look and, and more meeting rooms and engagement and real kind of vibrant opportunities when we do meet face to face to provide that focus when we are away from the office. Uh, I guess just the thing to remember on that with that spectrum, it is opinion, it's extremely broad, no one's going to please everybody and different companies are all going to have different kind of priorities in terms of their expectation of the candidates and how that works which i guess takes us on to our final poll of the morning as part of this we'd like to know from from everyone here what are the early signs of what your company is planning to do post pandemic so the options kind of is it is it fully remote fully office flexible but with kind of boundaries or, or flexible with with employees getting the choice or we, we don't want to ignore the people on kind of factory lines and logistics and, and the retail companies that that I guess for the past 12 months have had no choice but to be in their workplace so, so we've kind of kept that there cool and let's see the response so 3% looking at the full-time return to, to the past, so definitely a, a huge amount of change. That's 97% with some form of flexibility and, and probably not a lot between whether that's a company setting the parameters of that or whether that flexibility is being kind of passed on to the employees. So, so definitely interesting. And if any of you are unsure what, what your plans were, you can be kind of reassured here that, that everyone's probably in a very similar situation. So that's very good. Uh, so moving on, just to create a summary of what we kind of run through today. So you know, we know that the graduates have told us that kind of 62% of them feel it's going to negatively impact their career prospects, and actually 55% of HR decision makers agree with us. So no one's trying to paint a, a real kind of uh, lovely situation to how it is, and there is a realism that we need to be aware of. 53% uh, have struggled to make friends in the workplace by being remote, probably since the day they began in their business. Uh, again, that was agreed with by 59% of HR decision makers on that. 74% uh, have told us, uh, both graduates and HR decision makers, that joining a team virtually will help graduates from lower socioeconomic backgrounds access roles they may not have previously been able to. However, we definitely approach this with caution in terms of how this might look moving forwards. And definitely we need to understand a bit more about kind of some of the, the social poverty that, that creates kind of difficulty in having kind of designated workspaces or the required tech to be able to work properly at home and to do it as comfortably as, as others have been able to from there. Uh, as you can see here, two thirds of, of candidates surveyed weren't sent any home office equipment. So that's a desk or a chair to, to use at home. We know some have, have different ways or we'll, we don't definitely know whether everyone kind of requested this even from there, but we need to be conscious that that, that, that home workspace now is just as important as the, the physical workspace in the office and getting from, from there. And finally, 54% uh, feel that remote working has impacted their mental health, specifically around loneliness and doing that. However, on a more positive, we know from HR decision makers that 58% told us that they believe that graduates have actually enjoyed remote working and there are lots of positive 
So there's lots to weigh up. Naturally, there's, there's situations we weren't aware of previously, but it has created some, some real opportunity. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour through our research from there. However, it is fully available to download as a report. And I believe we will be sharing that a link in the comments section on here. So you can kind of click it from that. Uh, but if there's, a, there's any kind of questions outside of that, or you'd like to kind of delve any further into yes, by all means reach out and let me know from there. Uh, so that's it for me from the time being. We'll be back shortly with, with Charlotte and the, the employer panel. So yeah, any questions that come up, by all means raise them over. But I'm gonna hand over to Steve Ward now. He should be joining back in. There he is. <laughs> cool, and Steve's gonna to talk to us about some employer branding advice for his new workforce. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, uh, super interesting stuff. Good to get really good current reports as well on what's going on. It's uh, so a dramatic year. So, yeah, so look, I wanted to cover a little bit around um, our communication um, strategies in relation to communicating with um, next generation workforce um, and using some of the kind of the data and, and expertise that comes from Universums um, awareness and also awareness of the moving changes that are going on in the um, in the world out there right now. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide, so who are Universum? So we, um, we're the world's leading data-driven insight-led employee branding agency. Um, we do a number of work, basically it's a combination of research, we do an enormous amount of student research every year. Uh, in the UK alone, we survey over 40,000 uh, UK students and we survey about 1.5 million around the globe in 41 different countries in the world. So uh, we gather a lot of student data, a lot of future talent data, um, and we use that data as an informative um, insights driven process in order to make decisions around employer brand strategies, EVPs, creative outputs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's all data-led, insight-led kind of stuff rather than guesswork. So uh, that's a little who Universum are. So, so I wanted to look at the, and I think a lot of the questions have already been answered really well, actually by the polls as well, is the future of work remote? And I think what we've noticed there, I, I, actually I was quite surprised by that last poll, it was as high as 97%. Of, all, of everybody that said it was going to be a, a either fully remote or or semi-remote and only three percent about going back into the office so um i guess goldman sachs aren't on the call then but um so i think um but it, clearly there was uh, the hybrid thing is the thing that's from we're finding the most from most people we're talking to at the moment but one of the things this starts to therefore mean about communications is that what the look and feel of employer branding will start to change and what i'm thinking about here is the content and the look now the employer brand, you know, and this, these sort of images are something that's been very associated with employer brand over the last 10 years or so. The look and feel of the office, the feeling of what it's like to work there, the high fives in the corridor, all of those sort of things. They um, were very, I've always been very fundamental to kind of almost giving that kind of feel good element around employer brand, but they're largely aesthetic. Um, they weren't really the heart of what employer branding is, but it's certainly the, the frame, the window dressing effectively around it. But of course, this isn't going to be quite as important anymore because we now know that the decision making process of, of graduates going into the workplace will not be solely focused about where I'm going to sit. What does the canteen feel like? Is there a slide in the office? I don't think there's too many with a slide in the office. But the, 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 the other, there are going to be other factors that are going to be important now when you read up about a, a role or a company or look at the company uh, website or whatever else it might be to try and get a bit of an idea of who they're going to be working for. So, so and, and one symbol of that is something that we got from last year and when we did a survey last year. And this is actually professional research, um, because, but it, um, it definitely kind of relates to... Um, to the change of the pre-pandemic and the subsequent pandemic lifestyle environment of work. And in our research, so at Universal, we, as part of that research and survey process that we do with all of those students around the world, we have a structure called the 40 drivers of Universal, uh, Universal 40 drivers of employer attractiveness. So we look at 40 different factors uh, that make an employer attractive in different ways. And we ask students um, to, to tell us what they, want which of those 40 drivers are most important to them which is the most least important and we also ask them to judge companies based on these factors as well um, and when we looked at the difference between the people who completed the survey pre the pandemic and those that did it in the three months during going into the pandemic last year the three factors out of those 40 that moved 
up the most in desires from an employer and things they expect from an employer for both male and female respondents were embracing new tech, flexible working conditions and innovation. No surprise here. And this what starts them straight away reinforce some of the things that Chris was talking about earlier about the kind of things that need to be in the environment of, a, of somebody going into work is the expectation of tech, the expectation to be able to recognize there are other things going on around me that I'm going to have to take into consideration when I'm at work and of course alongside tech you're always expecting innovation and I think we all know that the world, the future of work, um, you know, it was written accelerated four years in, in six weeks last year um, and it, the as we embrace tech and we embrace kind of video stuff and things like this, it, and so it's almost expected now um, that when you demonstrate who you are as an employer and how you track to your as an employer, you're, you need to demonstrate these elements as being a key part of, of, of your strategy for hiring people and your strategy for looking after people. So simple thing to start with then, uh, demonstrate that you're ready for, the, uh, for a new world of work or a remote, 50% hybrid, whatever it might be, scale of work. So moving on to the next slide, um, let's get, a, so let's look into our research from, from last year. That's a little bit, uh, and, and this is 2020 research, and we're sort of hitting this as a, as a cusp where the 2021 research is about to come out. So um, for those of you who are interested in, in 2021 research, um, it's coming out in May, the, the new, and it's gonna be super, super fascinating because what I'm showing you here is some of the 2020 preferences, but a lot of these things are consistent. The reason why I still wanted to show this is because regardless of a pandemic or not, um, the pandemic is context behind everything. A lot of these things have, have been reasonably similar uh, over the years. But what I wanted to point the difference out here is, is the difference between Gen Y and Gen Z. And of course, what we're now, it's a Gen Z, if we kind of categorize in, in age group, the Gen Z categorization is now coming to the world. So it's the ones leading up to sort of 24 years old. So they're coming into the workforce now. And one of the things we noticed particularly last year, is this change between the difference between the Gen Y respondents in our research and the Gen Z respondents in our, in our research, combination of student professional research. Gen Y, if we look to the, the, um, the, the factors on the right-hand side, what has always been the case about Gen Y is almost like a portfolio career style. George, if you can just click the next uh, um, button. The, the, what it's, the, the, there's lots more things around collecting, gathering, they're looking for financial support, they need a lifestyle around their work, they, they, they purpose is absolutely there, but then what they're doing is receiving, they got look to leadership, they look to gather things. What and, and as somebody who's been around this recruitment space for quite a long time, one of the things we've noticed about Gen Y is typically, in fact actually people used to come to me when they were in a recruitment agency and used to say, I've done a year here, I'm going to go on, I've done a year at this company, I'm going to move on and go somewhere else and then collect. And it was like I said, it's a portfolio, it's gathering experiences and traveling at the same time, doing all this kind of lifestyle. The things we're seeing from the Gen Z responders, when people write Gen Z, as you can see, the rising ones on the left side are around clear path for advancement, career, future earnings, security, a friendly work environment, expected opportunities to make a personal impact, and much more about belonging, about career about security and impact which therefore implies a workforce that are maybe not looking around looking to kind of jump around like gen y did quite so much maybe they're looking to stay maybe they're looking to genuinely build a career inside the organization and that there starts therefore starts to give us clues about the fact that regardless of our working scenario whether we're at home or remotely one thing we've got to demonstrate is that career possibility, the ability to be part of something. It'd be really interesting if the, the panel's thoughts on this later, so they see a similar thing amongst their friends in the regards to the, um, into the, regards to the way we seem to be seeing. And this might come from the fact that we all know the Generation Y age group, which probably is in that, you know, in that sort of 30s largely now, or a great weight of them is in that late 20s, 30s. Because of the portfolio lifestyle, work career style, um, they're not really accumulated um, wealth through that period as much as maybe previous generations might have done and and we all know now it's blooming hard to buy a house before you're 35 years old now and a lot of this is down to how difficult it is to save in the modern environment so so I think we're learning the generation said is learning from their uh, elder siblings parents whatever else it might be and society in general to recognize that maybe they need to find some stability It'd be interesting to see that later so moving on to uh, the next slide, which um, looks at, so what, what I wanted to do is, is, is look at 
the, what does the talent needs and how do we address it as employers? And, and this is, again, it comes very much from the style of insights-led employer branding, rather than just saying things because I think they're good things to say. Give a purpose behind why it is you are saying a thing or communicating a thing. So what I did here is just the next slide, three slides or so, is pick out two or three of the things that are most prevalent in the in the in this new research um, in regards to what talent is looking for. And secure employment, I mean, it's kind of, kind of sounds obvious. What it was, it was actually number four in that 2020 research, but it was on the up, it was on the right. So again, it goes away from that kind of portfolio lifestyle where secure employment wasn't so important. Now, it, last year it was number four, this year, early signs are they will rise even further and early countries and our research have, have said that this is coming right at the top. So secure employment. So therefore, if it's important to future talent to see secure, secure employment, especially in this new environment where well, obviously we're worried about, oh, well, am I going to have a job in this company in a year's time? Are they still going to exist? Are they going to make redundancies? We just had a pandemic. A lot of people have been furloughed. Um, so there's a lot of insecurity. So if we can demonstrate security, Georgie, if you can click, then um, then if we can, how can we demonstrate that we are the safe harbor in the storm? How can we demonstrate that we are a landing place that is secure, that will offer that uh, cradle of, of a secure boat to, to sail on, rather than it being kind of in that zone of, I don't know whether I've still got a job here in a year's time, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we're also, we all know that some companies can't offer secure employment can't promise secure employment at the moment. I was talking to a couple of hospitality or large hotel groups just recently and they said honestly realistically we can't say that this is going to be a secure employment that's fine it's fine the whole point about the universe and 40 drivers employer attractiveness is you can't you don't hook everything on one factor we have to identify our strengths in the 40 and recognize that we're not going to be strong as others but if you are an organization that has the ability to say yeah we're offering a career we've got progress we've got security tell people tell the next generation super reassuring um, through this process and the next the so next one I, I wanted to kind of quickly look at was a friendly work environment this is a very this is always popular it's a very kind of generic phrase in a sense to, to say we expect we all want to work in a friendly environment of course we do but go, but this was a, a factor that Chris shared a little bit in the research about the fact that the challenge is now in a hybrid stroke remote environment loneliness sets in the ability to create friends from colleagues sets in. Most people in their early 20s often build their friends' networks out of work and their natural social network falls out of the workplace. But if we're not in the office next to each other, and we can't just naturally just nip to the pub afterwards or go out for a coffee or do lunch together like we would normally do, how do we demonstrate friendly work environment in this new pandemic? It's important to people. So how do you demonstrate it? If you, if you uh, just click there. So how can you show this is lived out remotely? So think about the initiatives your organization is doing that are fostering and helping people engage in communities inside your organization with similar interests inside your organization. And how is the hybrid? I think one of the interesting things for organizations to really show in their communications to talent right now is how hybrid our hybrid friendly work environment works. What is it like to be you know, three days of the week sat at home and then two days of the week next week? How does that impact work? And how do you balance those different kind of tones and flavors of the work experience and employment experience? So think about that. Think about, is this something you can show? Is it, how do we show this? How will we tell it? Because again, as we, the data tells us, students want to feel as though this is gonna be a, a good place to work, good people they wanna work around. And the final one of these I wanted to look at was professional training development. And this is a really interesting one. And um, again, harking back to what Chris mentioned earlier, this is not being provided straight away at the moment. And it's one of the things that in a recession, training development tends to get ditched a little bit, sadly. Um, and therefore, um, in a scenario like now, it becomes again, as Chris's uh, research proved, it's being ignored a little bit now. Yet, it is right near the top of the expectations of graduate talent when they're going into the workplace. So what are we thinking? Taking away training and development when it's the thing that, the, that they almost want the most out of an employer when they look into it. They want to, it's part of that security message. It's part of that development message. You know, they've worked through their um, education for such a period of time and they come into the work expecting the opportunity to grow and build and be the best they can possibly be. Um, because they've spent that time getting ready for it. But then we don't offer them training development and, 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 and use remote as an excuse. Hey, look, we've, what we've got to do, 
So let's look at how do we do this? How do we ensure that we are maintaining training and development opportunities in our organization? How can we articulate it? Doesn't mean you have to have this as much of a program as maybe you had five years ago and we could do things in workshops and, and around, send people around the world and all this kind of stuff that maybe we can't do now, but at least to demonstrate and communicate training progress methodology, the way in which you can support people, the mentorship programs or whatever else it might be is a smart move right now because it's something that will differentiate you because people are not talking enough about this and, um, and so therefore I would I would advise to do so. So to I think to some oh yeah no so and the one thing I just wanted to look here as well at is is how are we communicating this sort of stuff to this new workforce so so obviously I've talked a lot about the kind of messages and the kind of tone and subject areas that probably need some focus and it isn't just those three of course there are others inside our research if you want to talk to me more about it but here's a great example of how to simplify this sort of communication so HubSpot's a great example so quickly look at if we look at HubSpot's career page on their locations um, it demonstrates all their companies around the world um, but in the bottom right hand corner if you could just uh, do the next click in the bottom right hand corner um, there's remote um, and so alongside San Francisco and Bogota and, and, and everything else there's remote and what that means is that anybody who's looking at an employer and thinking well I'm expecting a remote environment expecting a hybrid environment how do I find out about it well if they only see Dublin Berlin Portsmouth Cambridge etc etc then they don't get any information so what then so what you can then do is click into the the HubSpot remote bit and it then shows you what to expect as a remote worker almost like the remote EVP effectively what are we going to well, how are we going to support you at home? So if you click through that, then uh, through the next three things, then you'll see that that uh, comes out from that. When you click on that remote, it then brings up another screen which says, what does, that, what does that mean for you? And then it brings up another screen when you click into it of what are the pillars of things that we promise you um, in, in remote working. I think things that are around technology, collaboration, community, etc. So HubSpot really were, they, they did this right at the start of the pandemic, super, super smart and super uh, simple way of just making sure we're, we are in forming candidates and talent that we have we thought about this we've thought about you and we've thought about that new work environment so just to run through some quick key tips quickly before I close um, so the first one is focus employer brand less on aesthetics and more about professional substance like I say it's less about the the, the look and feel and the paint color of the office uh, that's not going to be as important it's going to be interesting don't kill it but it's going to be but look at professional substance and moral support how we're going to look after people but remember one of the things that people are going to be looking for when they look at your career page or employer branding content etc is am i going to succeed um, here am i going to be a success in the organization because that is one thing around employer branding that never changes and never changes about um, em employment communication is you will this is how you're going to succeed um, and always remember that when we communicate employer brand messaging um, next one um, is communicate that care package. So ensure that we are. We've heard so many, so much stuff there from Chris around the challenges facing people on a remote work basis. Yes, there's some lovely comfort elements about it as well, but it is lonely. It is hard. It is challenging. So therefore, um, demonstrate how we support people through that. Have we got a well-being package? And what, what sort of things we got in that kind of way? And how is that? And has it been adapted for this new working world? That's fine. Click on. Um, and then communicate the success. Obviously, I've just mentioned this a second ago, but communicate the recipes for success. Can I be as successful working behind my laptop at home as I can be if I was sat in my office? So communicate those, how it's going to work, communicate success and, and support to achieve that. Um, the next one is consider how you address communicate by it. Um, I, don't want, I could have talked about this for quite a while, but just think about this a lot. When we communicate, um, the difference, particularly most people are talking looking at a hybrid um, option there. When we communicate hybrid, therefore what we've got to do is ensure there's no bias between people who work from home and people who sit next to the boss. The person who sits next to the boss shouldn't receive better treatment because they sit next to the boss than the person who exists at home. Equally, we also, a lot of some of us work in environments where we have people who have to work from you the office they have no choice because they are in manufacturing or engineering or or something in that kind of way and therefore when you've got a hybrid workforce with some people who have what is regarded as privileges sometimes of working from home how do we balance that out as well to ensure that we are treating people with equal care through this process 
The next one is play to your strengths. This is really, really important. I think it's very, very easy to all try and look like Google or I'll try and think that we've got the magic formula that everybody is looking for. We haven't. Play to our strengths. A universal methodology is simply to look at it and say, right, what does your target talent want? Out of those 40 drivers, what is important to them? Then look inside your organization using the same 40 drivers and see what the overlaps are. Look at our strengths out of those and see which ones overlap with what, the, uh, what the, the, the student talent is looking for from an employer, what they expect to find an employer. Play to your strengths, don't play to other people's strengths. Can't be everything to everybody. Use insights to go there. And then finally, um, you, and on the insights piece, um, the final uh, one there is to think about the creative process when we're communicating the creative process of um, telling our employer brand story, telling our uh, story as an employer, do it and understand talent insights first. Understand what they actually care to look at. Don't just throw things out on the stratosphere because they look cool or sound good. Actually, if they're off the pace, if they're off the pace of what talent wants now, probably now more than ever, given all the dramatic change in society and work life uh, world, then um, then we need to make sure we get it right. We need to make sure we make it right because people are making much more critical decisions about which employer they're going to work for now than they probably ever have done before so um, so that's all from me hopefully that's been useful a uh, few ideas to um to think about in the regards to employer branding if you want to speak to me more uh connect on linkedin and we can talk more about those insights and the student insights that are coming up uh, feel free to do so brilliant thanks for that steve that's fantastic so okay. yeah hopefully so it's a really key insight there not just about what candidates are feeling but some great stuff there from Steve about how we can change not just our, our processes but also how we kind of uh, kind of project that brand and make people aware of what we're doing and, and how we're doing it to, to really kind of reinforce the great work that I know so many people are doing at the moment uh, so yep yeah, that, that's from kind of us two so far today so now we want to move over so first you're going to introduce Charlotte who is a marketing executive on Milk Ground and she's put together what is always really really popular kind of a band of students and graduates at the moment as a chance to to get an idea in, in real life what are they feeling some some real kind of examples from from here and also an opportunity for for everybody kind of present at the moment to ask any questions so I'll hand over to Charlotte who introduced the panel. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed everything so far. Um, I think all the insights have been really, really interesting. And, and yeah, let's let's now hear some kind of real life stories. Um, if if our student and graduate panel wouldn't mind popping their cameras on. Um, here we all are. So we've got Katie, Antonia, Sophia and Daniel joining us today and um, they've all got really different stories to tell, different experiences, things like that. Just before we start, um, as Chris mentioned, please do feel free to pop any questions in the chat box, um, any that we don't get round to, um, if you pop down uh, your contact details there we can always reach out um to to our panel and get them to kind of um email you across some answers as well um their email addresses and linkedin profiles were on the slide before just before we end we'll bring that back up again um but please do connect with them and feel free to reach out to them to ask any other questions um they they'd really like to continue the conversation afterwards um and chat with you guys so we'll also be tagging them on our post on linkedin as well so you can reach them that way um, but firstly, I think it will be good if, if we get everybody to kind of do a little introduction, a bit about them, what they're up to. Um, so, Katie, if you don't mind, can we can we start with you? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name's Katie. I'm a 23 year old food science and nutrition student at Surrey University, um, and I'm currently in my final year. Perfect. Thank you, um, Antonia. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Antonia. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland and currently based in Northern Ireland. I have completed my undergraduate degree um, in social science and I'm doing my postgraduate master's degree um, in human rights law. Perfect, thank you. Um, Sophia, you wouldn't mind going next? 
Hi, I'm Sophia. I recently graduated from the University, the university of Leeds um, with History and Spanish, and I now work in recruitment. Perfect, thank you. And Daniel? Hello, um, I'm Daniel. I'm a business management with marketing student. Um, I'm currently studying at UE Bristol. I'm in my final year of my bachelor's. Um, I've obviously been studying remotely, but I've also been working in person throughout the pandemic. Great, thanks, guys. Um, so let's crack on with some of the questions. Um, I think firstly, it'd be good to know, has the pandemic impacted your plans in any way? Um, so, for example, I know, has anybody chosen to stay in education, living arrangements changed, um, things like that. So shall we go, Daniel, let's start with you this time, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, no, so my living arrangements haven't changed. Um, I live with my partner and I've got a two-year-old son. Um, I'm probably more Gen Y than Gen Z, going back to um, Steve's, Steve's um, presentation. Um, yeah, my plans haven't changed. I'm still trying to apply for graduate roles. I have contemplated um, staying on for further study, but just down to my situation and I guess the amount of debt I've already taken on <laughs> with my undergraduate, um, I'm not really sure about staying on. So yeah, I'm just continuing to apply for graduate roles. Um, I guess there's been a slight change in the type of roles I've been applying for. Um, I was originally um, set on staying in the private sector, but um, just being pragmatic, I've started to apply for roles in the public sector as well. So um, my overall plans haven't changed, but maybe the type of roles I've been applying for have. Great, thank you. That, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think, um, do you think that comes down to mainly um, because there's a lot more competition out there? So you think that you've been applying for jobs that you weren't originally thinking of, or is it just kind of a change of heart? Um, it's hard to say if there's more com competition. Might be more suitable. Sorry, um, it's hard to say if there's more competition because I've got nothing to judge it against, obviously. <laughs> um, so this is my first kind of first experience yeah. applying for um, graduate roles. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a lot harder than I thought it would be. So I guess it's kind of made forced me to kind of broaden my horizons and look in um, different areas that I wasn't maybe looking at before. Yeah, yeah, completely makes sense. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Antonia, should we, should we go to you next? Um, whether the pandemic has impacted your plans at all? Uh, it has in a in a positive way though. So um, I just graduated last May from Minerva, which is this very weird university where you you basically you study in seven different cities within your four years. So every semester you're in a different place all over. So traveling was a really really big part of my life for my undergrad. Um, and then obviously when the pandemic hit, that all had to close down immediately. Um, and with my graduate role that I got a month after. Um, after graduating, um, it involved a lot of travel, but I never would have been able to apply for it if there wasn't a pandemic happening um, because I wanted to do a my master's. Um, so with the pandemic um, closing everything down in terms of international borders and um, just day-to-day -day traveling, um, basically it meant that I could actually tech on this role um, because the traveling had to had to stop um, and the fact that my university went online for um, my master's degree meant that even if there was traveling I could still pursue both um, so the pandemic actually helped me to get a job and to do my degree in tandem um, so that was definitely something that was unexpected but positive because I would have had to to pick if it was normal circumstances yeah, that is really interesting. So actually, it's benefited you more than taking anything away because um, you've been able to do both alongside each other, which is quite a feat in itself. So hats off to you. Um, thanks, Antonia. Um, Sophia, should we go? Should we go to you next? Um, so yeah, the pandemic did quite change my original plans. Um, I graduated last June, so 2020. Obviously, in the midst of the pandemic, um, my plan was actually to travel for like six months to a year around South America. Um, and I wasn't actually originally planning to go into recruitment. I just realized when I got back, the sectors that I did want to apply for. So the more creative sectors were really hard hit. 
Um, so I decided to look at kind of sales recruitment. I reached out to recruiters as well and then spoke to some friends that were in the kind of industry and realized it kind of matched with my skill set. And I started doing that remotely from this January. I got it in November. Um, managed to meet my teammates like once in December and then it's all been remote from there. Um, and the, another positive, however, is one, I get to save some money. Um, at the moment, I'm living at home, which I was going to probably do anyway. And I started a podcast um, out of my kind of frustrations of the pandemic as well. It's called Straight Out Union. It's about uh, trying to give advice to people that are, have also graduated in pandemic. So it's allowed me to work and also kind of have a creative outlet at the same time. Yeah, definitely. That, that's really, really interesting. Um, I'll have to give you a podcast to listen, I think, and I think it could be quite useful to people. Um, but yeah, great. Thank you. And Katie, next. Um, my story is not actually as interesting as everyone else's um, seem to be. I My plan has kind of stayed the same. Um, I was on my placement year last year, so that was the thing that kind of got a bit messed up um, because of the pandemic and a lot of that ended up being remote towards the end although it was in a um, a key working sector so um, I was in in and out of the office still um, every now and then but it was very different to how it was going to be um, but I was always planning on um, going back and doing my final year this year and that's kind of happened anyway um, I did momentarily think about deferring but then I kind of thought what else what else would I do um, so yeah I mean my uni experience this year has definitely been very very different um because it has been predominantly online um almost the whole time and socializing has been very minimal um but that was still my plan I think next year my plans are to go um traveling that was always my plan um but I think that's kind of become more of a definite because I don't know whether I want to go straight into um trying to get graduate employment straight away firstly because um I think a break would be really really nice after um everything that's been gone on and um secondly because I think it's going to be really really competitive um straight after this year um and I think like waiting a year might just be a safer bet I'm not really sure um but yeah that's my plans yeah, I mean, that completely makes sense. Um, I mean, from from our research and from other people that we've spoken to, um, it's like instead of just having your your year's cohort of graduates that you're competing against, um, because more graduates haven't been able to find employment, it's actually almost as if you're kind of battling against 2020 graduates, even some 2019 graduates as well. So definitely there's the risk that there's going to be a lot more competition and I completely agree with you it would be really nice to take a break and get <laughs> traveling after everything that has been going on the last the last year or so so I really appreciate that um let's have a look at some of the other questions here um so for those of you who've taken part in any job applications and interviews what were they like so were they fully virtual did you have any face-to-face -face? um did, did you enjoy the process um and then question about feedback as well on the like whether you received feedback or not and if you if you found it useful um sophia should we should we jump to you because i know that you said that you found your found your job last year yeah so um i think when i graduated i applied for quite a few things um i actually managed to get a summer internship at this charity this marketing charity thing um but all of my inter i had so many interviews between probably july and november and they were all virtual which actually was quite nice because you had you could do it from home it was a bit less kind of pressure in terms of going into the office and that build up um but obviously i felt i feel like it is difficult to build that rapport um, as much if you're over a screen, you have to really be more emphasized, like show your personality a lot more. Um, but yeah, they weren't too bad. After a while, I got to know the structure of everything. And like, obviously, as you do more interviews, you improve. Um, my first one was like, I didn't even realize you had to ask questions at the end and stuff like that. So yeah, and I also contacted a lot of recruiters who helped me so much throughout the process, which I now use in my job to help other people. So um, yeah, it's been it's been interesting um to do it over the pandemic but it has its perks and its downfalls I guess yeah 
Yeah, no, it's interesting, Sophia. I know that kind of over half of the people that we'd interviewed had said that they felt they couldn't kind of reflect their true selves in in kind of a virtual environment. So, so it's really interesting that you kind of reinforced that as a comment. I guess something worth worth asking is: is there anything you would have changed about the processes that you've been in? Kind of on reflection, how mm. how could it maybe have supported you better or, or done more for you than that? Um, that's a good question. Maybe, I mean, to be honest, it was just like Zoom and then you start like normal questions. I don't know if we could have got more prep, but, um, or maybe have like an initial call on the phone. I don't know, maybe something beforehand, but I think it was as well as they could have done it for the time. Um, I don't really know how else you could have improved that, but, um, some of them I did have a set virtual assessment centers which they're kind of overwhelming because you have loads of people popping up on the screen and then you get into breakout rooms so obviously sometimes you have technical difficulties but I thought it was quite clever that they managed to do that and it was a lot less nerve-wracking than being in an assessment center with loads of people so I think they did as, as well as they could considering the circumstances to be honest yeah oh, thank you yeah, thanks. Yeah, really interesting that you mentioned the assessment centres there, because um, a lot of people that we, we've spoken to and a lot of employers have actually not not run assessment centres or have been trying to find alternative ways. So it's good that you took part in some of those in the, in the breakout rooms and you actually found them better than, than going in person. So I completely understand that it might have felt a bit overwhelming having everybody's face all pop up on the screen. But again, like you said, bit less so than going in and meeting all these people for the for the first time so thank you um daniel should we should we go to you um how's your kind of job application process been what have you found enjoyable and uh, virtual in person over to you um i've applied for quite a few um jobs um, graduate schemes I kind of mirror what Sophia was saying I think there are there are definite definite pros and cons I think the kind of ease of being able to stay at home um, is more convenient but I do feel like um, the employers haven't really done enough to kind of fix the disconnect I feel like a lot of it has, has felt very um, sterile there's been a lot of tests a lot of aptitude tests a lot of um, psychometric testing and then when you get through to interviews a lot of it is just a, a recorded question where you get a set amount of time to answer um i feel like i've felt very disengaged um i feel like the recruiters have definitely missed the trick in kind of connecting with people with this i feel it that, that there's a lot more room for kind of face-to-face -face interviews especially as it's there's a lot more room for convenience um, I've even had interviews where I've been interviewed by a graduate who just graduated last year, which kind of made me feel like they weren't necessarily taking my application seriously. Um, and also with feedback, I think there's been a lot of talk about um, mental health, anxiety. I've spent a lot of time um, going through applications, doing interviews, prepping, researching the company. Um, I've had to, you know, make arrangements. As I said, I'm a parent. I've had to make arrangements in my personal life to to do interviews and applications and then to kind of receive a generic email saying i'm sorry you've not you've kind of not been successful we can't offer you any feedback at this time to be honest kind of felt like a bit of a kick in the teeth because i think it's, if someone's had to watch that watch my interview or read my application and mark it against a set of criteria i feel like it would be fair to then provide me with that marking so i kind of have something to move forward with and um, yeah, I think it's kind of a bit of practice what you preach. I think a lot of employers do speak about mental health and kind of well-being, but then they don't necessarily always back that up, which I think is something that needs to be improved. Yeah, yeah, I completely, I completely echo what you're saying. It must be so frustrating. I remember when I graduated and was uh, was applying for lots and lots of roles. When you got that automatic response, that definitely kind of felt like a kick in the teeth. I mean. Um, Again, when when we've spoken to a lot of a lot of employers, we've had a couple of focus groups and, and things like that with employers, and they've said that they've been overwhelmed with applications. Um, but obviously, that that shouldn't then mean that your journey is is worse than it should be, or you felt like not as good as the process as it should be. I think, you know, 
with the expectation that there should be a lot more applications because of the pandemic and things that are going on um there are things that employers could could put in place or or i mean i'm not quite sure what they are maybe chris maybe you can jump in and, and give some suggestions of where you've had good conversations with employers but yeah something something needs to be needs to be done there i think yeah no it was a point that came up last week actually about one of the questions we had in our focus group was how do we how, how can they handle the sheer volume and how can they kind of give everything kind of the care and attention it deserves and, and you're completely right is that you've invested time in that business you i mean steve if steve was here now he'd probably say just how much of a value you can lose someone at the very beginning before you've even kind of engaged with them and made them an employee so it's extremely important i guess there's there's an understanding of the challenges on the other side and, and no one's got that silver bullet to solve it it came up the other day that uh using an ats and having these systems and some of this automated stuff can alleviate that pressure on on these individuals but then like you've said you lose that kind of connection and that discord by having that that regular kind of face to face with people so i think it's something that's just worth kind of bringing to the fore and, and improving that awareness to say look if there's something in the process that needs to be kind of negotiated on or, or adjusted don't make feedback that make feedback regardless of what happens that number one key and you're, you're completely right you've invested in that business it may be a situation at the moment they find it really difficult to kind of respond to you but who what's to say in five years time you might revisit and go actually i had a bad experience there and this, this kind of stuff can reverberate throughout people's careers or we know how much you might share that with with other people that within your own network and everything so i guess I'd love to say there's a really simple answer about how employers' workloads can be as easy as possible to give you the dedication that you kind of deserve. But at the same time, we just need to keep raising it and try and give it as much kind of airtime as possible, really, because because it's key and you've raised that there. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, Daniel. Yeah, and maybe maybe as we come towards sort of the end of the pandemic and well, hopefully the end of everything kind of going on at the moment as well you might get a bit more of that face-to-face -face engagement as well like um whether that's still virtual but instead of having a robot or like you said pre-recorded maybe it's just that the feedback is here that you do still like those interviews with with real people so you, and people so you can see that they are taking your application seriously and, th and things like that um so that's definitely definitely something to consider thank you um katie i know that you're still a still a uni student and everything but have you have you had any interview experience or anything like that this past year um no i actually um, haven't um had any like interviews i know a lot of my placement ones were virtual anyway that was pre-pandemic okay. um so for my placement um a lot of my interviews apart from the final interview were all um virtual ones and um as daniel was saying kind of like the pre-recorded questions and um it wasn't very personal um but yeah that was that was last uh like this time two years ago so okay interesting then that they were already kind of adopting the virtual the virtual interviews and, and onboarding uh recruitment processes and things there um did you enjoy it or did you did you quite like actually that there was like you said your final interview was sort of in person so did you quite like that maybe to begin with you didn't have to make that massive commitment of going going to them to do the interviews but then obviously when it was more serious then you you went in and actually met them did you quite like the hybrid um um would you have yeah i think it was it was good um in that sense because i only had to go there once and it was a fair distance um but yeah, I think it was definitely really valuable having that one um, kind of face to face contact with them and seeing the actual environment and all those kind of things um, that were mentioned earlier on. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Katie. Um, and Antonia, what about you? How has your experience been um, with the recruitment process and everything like that? Um, I'm expecting mostly virtual after um, after what you were saying earlier. 
Yeah, I mean, I come from a very unique position, I think, where when everything went online, I had been used to, you know, online working, online interviews, online um, school for the last five years. So it definitely wasn't something that that took me aback. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it, it has actually opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, and I echo what everyone says, where there is, it can be really hard to get wrap your head around um, and get used to, you know, especially if you're used to very much in-person context. But for someone who hasn't been used to a very in-person context, um, I find it really helpful for um, logistical reasons. So, for example, I was living in Argentina and I was um, like applying for a job that was in the US. Um, and obviously I couldn't fly to the US to do the interview, especially if I wasn't going to get the job. Like that's a huge commitment and that's a lot of money. Um, but being able to arrange it virtually um, meant that I could do the interview, you know, apply for lots of different jobs, do interviews for lots of different jobs. And then if I ended up getting one of the positions, could fly over and then end up going there in, in person and, and committing to, to being there for whatever said amount of time. Um, so that was a couple of years ago. Similarly, I just got a position in January um, that was based in Bristol. And I don't have the resources at the moment to fly over to Bristol um, to do the interview. And again, even if I had, I would be quite hesitant um, to fly somewhere uh, for an interview because it is so uncertain whether or not you'll, you'll even get the position. Um, I think there's a big thing to be said for virtual interviews. And then if the person gets the job, if they're happy to relocate, you know, then they can relocate. But expecting someone to, you know, drive all the way to London or fly to to, to Bristol or, or somewhere else, especially myself as a Northern Irish student, um, I think it, it can be really hard to try and do all those interviews beforehand. And I would have caught off a lot of um, people beforehand because they said, OK, well, I can't get there, so there's no point applying. Um, but if these have virtual interviews, then you can you know, do the interview. And if you're successful, then you can choose to relocate afterwards. Um, so I do think it opens up a lot of opportunities. And for me, I, I ended up getting the, the job that is in Bristol and it's never going to be in Bristol because uh, it's a six month contract and it finishes in, in July. So there's um, it opened up a lot of opportunity and the fact that I could now take on this role without actually having to to relocate. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's... Saying here as well sorry, is, Chris. I know, sorry. Uh, I know what Steve was saying before is about that kind of virtual and physical kind of potential bias as well. So it's interesting you said there that why because you're in South America should, should you not be treated the same and, and would employers start attaching value on well this person made the effort of getting on the train and coming to see us whereas whereas not and actually if, if we're looking for kind of more equality as we move forward it's it's learning it's it's great if someone come to see you but not to attach these values or not to kind of create bias versus kind of in person and, and virtual as we start to move to something which was evidence today is definitely going to be a much more kind of hybrid world in the future of of home and office based work and that that spectrum again that we've seen is some some might be in 80 percent some might be in 20 that we don't that we value people behind their laptops in their kitchens or bedrooms or whatever else and not attaching kind of untrue value just because someone is is kind of ever present or something so that's interesting there even at, at the assessment stage that we we take on board some of those points that Steve made, which is great. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, sorry if you can hear if you can hear my dogs in the background. <laughs> they uh, the postman just so they're a little bit cross at him. Um, but yeah, a really interesting point that you made as well about being like the companies being able to reach a lot more people um, when it's virtual because you know even if they then have to relocate if they are successful, you're still reaching out to people that may be much more suitable for the job, but just because, you know, when they graduate, they live, you know, 50, 60 miles away or even further, it doesn't mean they're less suitable for the job if they are willing to relocate if that's necessary. So I think that's a really interesting point there as well. I will add something just in there um, though, feedback from clients last week that what they don't want is people applying for jobs, that if they do then ask them that in, if the future is more office based, that there aren't kind of wasted applications of people that will accept a job and then kind of they, they feel one employer in question was saying they really need to reinforce that if you're successful and if in six months time we return to a much more kind of office based environment they want that level of commitment and, and I think there is that fear of kind of we had it for kind of years leading up to the recession of, of candidates almost like claiming two or three jobs and reneging 
the ones that they didn't want at the last minute. And I think there's that fear that that could return in this belief that, well, we've got this freedom and this kind of virtual world now doesn't isn't going to suit every business. And so I, I think there was that reinforcement that candidates are conscious of not applying for jobs on the belief that they may have that flexibility always. Always make sure you, you ask that question, you're clear before going any further, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's also down to the employers as well to make sure that in the job description and things like that, they're being super clear about if it is going to be fully remote and that's kind of what they see for the future or if there is some kind of hybrid or, you know, if they're up for discussion about it as well I think just making that super clear um and then like you said it's asking the question so that you're not if you do get the job you're not suddenly shocked when they're when they're like right you need to like you said move to Bristol or something like that um great thank you um I'm conscious of time so let me just have a quick look at some of these other questions um I think we will ask some of these about the about the future um so what what are you looking for in an employer as we move back to some form of normality um so again like would you prefer to be working in an office or virtually or a mix of both um as well what type of office culture would you be excited to see um so what i think as steve was talking about with the different offices and the slides and things like that is that something you're looking for or or, or something completely different um and then in terms of communication as well um with line managers and things like that um what are you kind of looking for sorry i know that's a lot of questions all bunched into one um but daniel should we start with you um so my experience through the pandemic is that i've i've been working in person so i've been quite used to being around everyone um i think it's unrealistic to think that things are going to go back to Every, everyone being in, in office or in location. Um, so I just kind of think it would be nice to have some kind of mix. Um, I think when people are physically at work, it would be nice um, for it to be kind of as open as possible and kind of encourage people people to mix and build those relationships. Um, I know from my working experience, one of the one of the things that's made the company I work for um, successful is the relationships between the staff. There's a lot of people I work with who I class as my friends and I just think it's important for companies to make sure that as we go through this transition and where more work is done remotely that we don't kind of use that connect with people because I think that is something that that can build um success yeah yeah definitely I think that that's where like um with you especially having work been working in person for this whole time like you can see the benefits of being able to mingle with your colleagues and, and make friends and things like that. So even for for those industries where you know maybe the remote working is continuing is still is still an option. Um, I think it's good to take that into consideration and make sure that you are still you know offering opportunities for socials and things like that. So thanks, Daniel. Um, Sophia, you next. Um, yeah, I mean my current job um, already pre-pandemic was doing flexible working and that was something that attracted me to the job so it was Mondays and Fridays you work from home and then Tuesday afternoon and then Wednesday Thursday you're in the office and personally I think that's a great balance um, I wouldn't want to be full-time now having experience working from home in the office but I would not want to be full-time remote either so I think um, definitely a bit of flexible working. That's something I noticed starting a job remote has been really difficult. So I think you need to be in the office to socialize with your colleagues, learn from them as well. There's so much like I've got really good communication with my director and like the people on my team, but it's not the same as being in person. You do pick up little tips having people in the office. Um, and what you mentioned briefly as well about um, socials, it'd be great to have kind of a sociable environment at work. That's something I really kind of look for. Um, and hopefully, you know, after work drinks and socials and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, flexible working, socials and good communication. Um, in my current job, I'm quite lucky because it's a really small team. And um, I literally like, call my director like every like once a day. Um, and if I need anything, we message. So it's good to have that communication there. Um, maybe in larger companies, you obviously have like your, your line manager or this or that. But I think that's really important, especially when you're starting your first a graduate job or your first job as well so yeah that's what i'd say yeah yeah i think that's i think that's a really good point to make um it's great that you can still 
reach out um sorry i think my my tech went a bit funny there um it looked like everybody was all all blurry but we're all back now um yeah i think um i think that's a really good point you raised about communication um you know some people that we've spoken to have had you know easier lines of communication with their managers and directors because instead of having to go knock on the office door you know build yourself up to go and speak to somebody who's maybe a few few rings up the ladder from you it's just a it's just a quick message or, or a phone call or something like that so um i think making sure that those lines of communication are still really strong whether you're in the office whether you're out of the office you know um being accessible to people especially people who are just joining a new job like you said to learn from and to, to get to grips with everything and meet people is, is really important thanks Sophia. um antonia we can go to you next yeah, I actually have a point on what you just said, and I completely agree with what Sophia and Daniel have said about the flexible working hours, like half and half would fit me perfectly. So I'm not going to, you know, just repeat the same thing, but I agree completely. Um, but one thing I would bring up is that idea of communication. Like, I do think um, being able to contact, you know, your manager and your teammates um, almost on a 24-7 basis is really helpful. You know, um, the one thing that I think has has come up with flexible um working and, and working from home is this fact that you know you can start kind of whenever or end whenever for me i don't have set working times um because my team is all over the world so as long as the work gets done you know that's kind of the the premise of it but one thing that i have noticed is um it's been really really difficult to set boundaries at work um with some of my employers because you know they'll they'll send me an email at 9 p.m and expect it to be done by 8 a.m the next morning um and it would be like no um sort of warning beforehand you know it, you're kind of expected to work all the time because you're at home um and part of me is okay with that with the idea that we're in a pandemic i have nothing else to do i don't really have a huge social life right now but at the same time it has been you know it's been really hard in terms of mental health and being able to find that work-life balance because the life has almost been taken away and it's just kind of work because you don't you know you can't get out you can't socialize you can't go for drinks um so it has been a lot more intense in terms of both the hours that i'm i'm putting into work but also um, it kind of feels like it's been expected um, and I don't know um, if this is just I have two jobs and I'm, I'm feeling the same way for both jobs so maybe it's a it's more of a climate and maybe it's more of the actual the work I'm doing but regardless um, that is one thing that I think employers should be very aware of is this idea of making sure that you can set boundaries and and making sure your employees feel that they can set boundaries of you know it's seven o'clock I'm turning off my email I need to kind of um, relax, I need to have an evening, I need to be with my family um, and not expect just because we are at home 24-7 to be working 24-7 um, because it, it takes a toll, you know, the pandemic is already really hard for people, we're already socializing on our computers, working on our computers, like it, it's a lot and I think, um, you know, keeping that in mind for, for employers and, and knowing that you're, just because your employee is, is, you know, on their laptop all the time, it doesn't mean that they have to or should be working all the time because um, yeah, I think that's that's one thing that's been quite difficult for me to try and figure out how to how to set those boundaries. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a great yeah, there actually. One of the responses to other polls in, in the research that we had was actually, I, I'd say quite surprised actually, the number of people that said that productivity has improved since people were graduates, since things have gone remotely. But that's definitely kind of the context on that is, well, what else have you had? Oh, you're trying to make an early impression. You can't physically leave an office the way that you could have before. But actually, that we, we maybe need to be conscious of it then that that we're not potentially burning people out or giving kind of unrealistic expectations that there is that need for a detox. Everyone understands that there is that we're hopefully a couple of weeks away from being allowed to do something slightly more enjoyable than a walk in a park and and to do those and, and not to take that away from you because the normal world always was just that and, and not for people to go well hang on you were really productive when you had nothing else to do <laughs> and now here we've, we've seen kind of a dip and we're back to how you would have been in an office you might as well come back i think that's a really great <clears throat> piece of context there that that applies to that, that that hopefully people don't look at it and go brilliant when people work from home we get so much more out of them because we know in most of these things it, it will encourage a problem in in years to come actually when people suddenly realize hang on what have I been doing all this time? It's not it's not healthy to reply to emails at nine o'clock at night, all, all of the time anyway, or to, or to do that. So definitely key and, and reflects what, what we were hearing today from employers. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm um, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Antonio. I'm really, really conscious of time. Um, Katie, do you have anything really quick to add? Sorry, I don't want to cut cut you short um, or anything. Um, no, no, it's completely fine. Um, I was just going to um, basically echo what Antonio was saying about boundaries. Um, and with work, I think it is. I'm a particularly a person who needs kind of that discrepancy. So I think um ideally I would like predominantly in person work but I do also agree that having that element of flexibility if needed is really important so I think maybe having the option and then I would potentially go to the office um most of the time um but I think having that flexibility and that option depending on your circumstances and everything um is really really important but I think yeah for me it's just having that kind of home is for home work is for work kind of split yeah Perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut your answer short there, but no, no, don't worry at all. <laughs> no, it's fine. Like I'm just conscious on that. Go on. No, you go, Chris. Uh, yeah, it does look like we're out of time. So, firstly, thanks for everybody here, Katie, Daniel, Sophia, Antonio. Some really good insight. Brilliant. Thanks again to Steve for for joining us from Universum and sharing that kind of employer branding insights. And, and also for, for Charlotte and, and your help there. So, so thank you, everybody. Hopefully it was useful to everybody. A reminder here, our student and graduate panel, if anyone wants to reach out to any of the individuals, we've also got all of your information as well. So we can share the recordings, we can share the, the research uh, if, if nobody's kind of received that yet. And if there are any questions outstanding that we didn't get to, we can obviously have a look and get back to you in person as well from there. So I guess, yeah, have a great rest of the day and, and thank you for joining us. Goodbye.